Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And in our ongoing series on Nobel Prize winners, our feature tonight will be Dr. Alfred G. Gilman, who died recently at the age of 74. Dr. Gilman shared the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1994. He was a co-winner along with Dr. Martin Rod Bell for the discovery of the G protein. The G protein was a protein inside the cell that responded to stimuli outside the cell and caused the cell to perform specific functions through intracellular messengers such as cyclic AMP. These messengers are known as secondary messengers and they're released inside the cell after the activation of the G protein. Before the discovery of the G protein, it was unknown exactly how chemical signals were transmitted from the outside of the cell to the inside, which is a process known as transduction. Here's a brief explanation of how common signals, such as hormones or drugs, can stimulate the inside of the cell through the mediator G proteins. How does the extracellular signal of a hormone get transmitted into the cell? This is commonly accomplished using second messengers, small molecules such as cyclic AMP or calcium. Second messengers relay information from the first messenger, the hormone, into the cell. These second messengers are often produced using common proteins associated with the plasma membrane called G proteins. G proteins are coupled to receptors in the plasma membrane of the cell. G protein coupled receptors can mediate the responses to signals such as hormones and neurotransmitters. Many different types of ligands can activate G proteins such as fatty acids, proteins, peptides, or amino acids. Interestingly, about half of all known drugs work through G protein coupled receptors. So basically, you can think of it as a three-step process. You have a receptor on the outside of the cell that binds with a hormone or a drug. This stimulates the G protein inside the cell. That was what was discovered by Drs. Rod Bell and Gilman. And that, in turn, causes a cascade of secondary messengers. The secondary messengers then stimulate the cell to perform a precise function. Interestingly enough, the secondary messenger system through cyclic AMP was discovered by Dr. Earl Sutherland, who was the person who recruited Dr. Gilman to Case Western Reserve early in his career. Dr. Sutherland won the Nobel Prize in 1971 for his discovery of cyclic AMP in the secondary messenger system. Coming back to Dr. Gilman, he comes from a distinguished scientific lineage. His father was Dr. Alfred Gilman also. The senior Dr. Gilman was a distinguished pharmacologist and edited the most important text in pharmacology, The Pharmacologic Basis of Therapeutics. The book is known as Goodman and Gilman, for he and his co-editor, Lewis Goodman. It's the book every student in medical school has to study. The junior Dr. Gilman, who by the way, its middle initial is G and it stands for Goodman, his father's co-editor, did not want to go into pharmacology. He wanted to go into biochemistry. The turning point in his career was being accepted to the MD-PhD program at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland by Dr. Sutherland. And he went on with a lot of the other great minds of the time to work on intracellular, extracellular communication. Here is an overview of his career from the introduction to his Nobel Prize lecture. Alfred Gilman was a very famous pharmacologist. He collaborated with the equally famous Lewis Goodman to produce the standard textbook of pharmacology, which became known only as Goodman and Gilman. To stack the odds even further, his son, this year's Nobel laureate, was named Alfred Goodman Gilman. And indeed, he has been the editor and chief editor of this book and maintained it as the Bible of pharmacology. Alfred G. Gilman received his MD from Case Western Reserve, where he also got his PhD, tutored by Ted Rawl. He became very widely known when he developed the first really useful method to determine the levels of cyclic AMP, known mainly as the Gilman method. He realized that in order to solve many of the intricacies of the signal transduction, it was necessary to use new methodology. And he uh, got postdoctoral experience in biochemistry and cellular genetics, working in the lab of Michael Nirenberg at the NIH. When he got his position at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, he was able to attract the number of eminent scientists who were then postdocs and to set uh, out to the oddest task of defining and purifying the G proteins and studying them in meticulous detail. After moving to Dallas to become the chairman of the Department of Pharmacology, his work on G proteins and adenyl cyclase has continued to yield spectacular results. G proteins are required for signaling induced by such diverse things as photons, 
small odorant molecules, large polypeptides such as thrombin, practically all neurotransmitters, and a host of different hormones. They can influence an amazing variety of cellular events, from ion channels to the generation of many, many different second messengers. And in this way, they can control such diverse processes as a neurotransmission that, that occurs in a fraction of seconds until things such as proliferation or differentiation that can affect the organism for the rest of its life. Although our current understanding of the fundamental role of G-proteins in physiology and increasingly in medicine depends upon the work of many, many different people all over the world, the critical discoveries were made in the laboratories of Martin Rodbell and Alfred Gilman over about a decade. In his Nobel lecture, Dr. Gilman explains the importance of G-proteins in developing evolutionary complexity and more complex cellular systems. I think the real reason that we have G-proteins is that so we can build very complex signaling switchboards that have enormous adaptability, flexibility, etc. The bottom line really is that each cell can make a choice. It can look at the genome, uh, look at these modular components, lots of receptors, lots of G-proteins, lots of effectors, and each cell can design its own highly customized switchboard. Uh, from these components using systems of this sort build in a, a number of very fascinating sort of outputs and, and really customize it for each cell's need. In his Nobel interview, Dr. Gilman gave an interesting analogy about scientific work such as his. Another way of thinking about it is the value of understanding how something came to be, not just what it looks like, but why does it look that way, and what was the process that created it? Really thinking in evolutionary terms. If you can understand why a system was built the way it was, and what constraints evolution put on the way that the thing was built, and this isn't all completely intuitive and obvious, but uh, you know, I think that you will acquire deep insight into why how something really works if you understand how it came to be, rather than just what it looks like when it was finished. I heard an analogy once which somebody described trying to understand baseball by taking photographs of a baseball game, and you can take as many photographs as you like and show them to somebody who doesn't know what baseball is, and they still really won't understand how baseball works or how it came to be. Yeah, cricket's even worse. Than <laughs> a cricket's unfathomable <laughs> to everybody. <laughs> well, let's see if we can extend that. If you had movies, of course, it would help, rather than the snapshots. Um, but if you had movies of um, baseball at the beginning of the last century and along the way, um, and you could see how the game changed, that would probably help a good deal, too. Mm. How, did it how did it evolve? What forces led to what changes? And finally, Dr. Gilman's thoughts on the current American educational system and its implications for scientific progress. The concerns of the moment are the level of funding, for sure. Another major concern is the, um, the number of young people who are going into scientific careers. There's a, a paucity of U.S. educated students who are going into basic science careers. Many probable causes for it. A public education system that is, um, I think, weak as far as science education is concerned. There are many reflections of, of that scientific awareness in this society. So that is a big issue, and I think the perceived level of competition and compensation in careers in science is probably a bit of a turnoff as well. Mm. So the United States is relying more and more on um, foreign-born science uh, who are coming to be trained here, and happily many are staying here, and um, that's a clear trend. So those are big issues, too. Mm. Mm. In, in, the, in, in terms of the outreach to children and getting children interested in science, it, it is strange, isn't it? Because the U.S. has a very high level of um, competence at reading at very young ages, and then suddenly it seems to fall behind on scientific education. I'm not aware of the reading statistics. I'm glad to hear that something seems to be going well, but uh, you know, most of the data I see shows um, U.S. school children well behind um, many, many other countries in the world in terms of educational competence. Um, there's, there's 
growing concern about the problem and various programs to, uh, that will hopefully be effective in correcting it, but I still fail to see a real public commitment to public education in this country. And I think there's sad reflections of that in terms of things that just jar badly with my own sensitivities. We're going to close tonight with Joe Jamail, who died recently at the age of 90. He was the fear trial lawyer from Texas, the king of torts, one of the country's best trial attorneys, best known for driving Texaco into bankruptcy. In a Houston courtroom in 1985, he won a $10.5 billion verdict over Texaco on their interference over Pennzoil taking over Getty Oil. Here's Texas Television on the death of Joe Jamail. A University of Texas icon has passed away. Joe Jamail died today from complications with pneumonia, according to University of Texas officials. He is considered one of the country's greatest trial lawyers and has been a major benefactor to the university since graduating from UT back in 1952. Well, there are already facilities on campus that honor Jamail. Longhorn players play on the Joe Jamail Field inside Daryl K. Royal Texas Memorial Stadium, and a swim center is also named after him. UT President Gregory Fenvis said on Twitter today that the university lost a great friend. Former Secretary of State James Baker called Jamail one of the finest attorneys the world has ever known. Here's one of the bankruptcy specialists working on the Texaco bankruptcy describing what happened. Texaco had an extraordinary issue arise. Everyone knows about why it had to go into Chapter 11, which was that Pennzoil Company obtained from a Houston court an $11 billion judgment against Texaco. And when the Supreme Court ruled that Texaco had to post a bond like anyone else, uh, Texaco had to file and commence its Chapter 11 case. Texaco reached a settlement with uh, Pennzoil to settle the $11 billion judgment for approximately $3 billion. Well, Joe Jamail made between $300 and $400 million on that settlement, and he gave much of that money to the University of Texas, including them naming their football field Joe Jamail Field at Darrell Royal Stadium. And here he talks about his friendship with Darrell Royal, Willie Nelson, and George Strait. So Joe Jamail Field, when you saw them come out and you see Joe Jamail Field up there and, and you're sitting What's the feeling that strikes you when those when those kids come out and the coaches come out? Well, I get a little emotional. I get a goosebumps. It's a hell of a scene. Yeah. They playing my school song. And they got all this going. Sitting there, and we got Daryl sits with me at every game. Mm -hmm. Daryl needs me. George Strait, Willie when he's in town. They're a good group. What do you remember? This is a signed autograph here, Coach Royal, James Street. There, 1969 at national championship years. Yeah. Tell us, tell us a little about that and. and what you remember about that? Oh, it was just magnificent. But see, I got used to it. He won in '63 as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were at Cornavaca together. Lee and I ate it there on Willie House. Oh, it was just a holiday. Somebody, I ran into somebody in a bar where I usually run into people. They were complaining about Coach Royal not passing enough. We we're having a beer around the pool that night. And I said, Coach, do me a favor. He said, anything. I said, play one damn game and don't throw it once, not once. Okay. So I forgot about it. We get back. They go to AM to play AM. BD and I, 49 to nothing. Never threw it once. I get a call from the locker room at AM. <laughs> How'd you like that, lawyer? <laughs> I urge you to go back and look up both our James Street and Daryl Royal podcasts. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tapps. The rumor is, and I don't know if it's true, that Daryl Royal and Willie Nelson kept Joe Jamail up all night drinking before his final arguments in that Texaco trial. So to close tonight, I'm going to close with one of my favorite Willie Nelson songs, and I think it's the best version ever done by Little Miss Dynamite, Brenda Lee. As a final tribute to Joe Jamail, here's Ain't It Funny How Time Slips Away. Well, hello there. My, it's been a long, long time. How am I doing? Oh, I guess I'm doing fine. It's been so long now, and it seems that it was only yesterday. Gee, ain't it funny how time slips away.